first heard about the possibility that things might go wrong with this pregnancy at the 20 week ultrasound. And that was when they found a complete placenta previa. And I started to learn about the risks associated with that. Our, our physician explained to me that there was a risk that the placenta could adhere to the inside of the uterus and could potentially even grow through the uterus and beyond it. But at the time, I don't think I understood quite how serious and how close we would come to leaving three children without a mother. Placenta accreta is increasingly common because more women have the two greatest risk factors for accreta, prior cesarean delivery and placenta previa. Accreta deliveries are particularly complicated and require a skilled team with practice technical coordination to achieve a good outcome, a healthy mom and a healthy baby. Many placenta accretas are first diagnosed at the time of surgery. However, preoperative diagnosis occurs in fewer than one half of patients, so for optimal results, it's important for obstetricians to know the key steps for beginning the operation and how to successfully complete a cesarean hysterectomy. Our goals are to help medical professionals optimize the care of women with a placenta accreta. When accreta is suspected, women should be directed to an accreta center of excellence for their delivery. These centers offer a multidisciplinary team with specialists in obstetrics or maternal fetal medicine, a surgeon who manages complicated pelvic operations, an obstetric or cardiac anesthesiologist, an interventional radiologist, and an intensive care unit. In addition, it's critical to notify the blood bank and transfusion medicine in order to effectively prepare for a potential massive blood loss. It's essential to have arranged for multiple units of cross-matched blood prior to the planned operation. Women whose deliveries were performed by a multidisciplinary team like this did better, had less early morbidity, fewer transfusions and fewer re-operations. These results translate to improved outcomes for these women and their babies. Women at high risk for placenta accreta should undergo an ultrasound by a sonographer who's expert at identifying accreta. Women at highest risk for accreta are those with prior cesarean deliveries and placenta previa. After a single cesarean delivery, accreta is uncommon, seen in only about three per thousand women. But if the placenta is a previa, the risk for accreta goes up to 25%, rising to 40% with previa and two prior cesareans, and 60% after three prior cesareans. Women with a prior cesarean delivery and previa should have an ultrasound and careful expert evaluation of the placenta for accreta by a technician with established experience. The hazards of placenta accreta are well known. The most significant risk factor is the mother's potential life-threatening hemorrhage. Approximately 95% of women with accreta require blood transfusion, with nearly 40% requiring more than 10 units and 10% requiring more than 20 units. In addition to hemorrhage, other maternal morbidities associated with placenta accreta deliveries include surgical damage to surrounding organs, most commonly the bladder, thromboembolism, infectious morbidity, and rarely, death. Given the complicated nature of these deliveries, professional organizations recommend that women with placenta accreta with previa are delivered between 34 and 36 weeks. Multi-team management developed through extensive communication between teams before each case is crucial for the safest delivery. Besides physician-to-physician -physician conversations between maternal fetal medicine, obstetric anesthesia, and pelvic surgery, communication among other providers who may become involved, trauma surgery, 
vascular surgery, the main operating staff, the interventional radiology staff, nursing, neonatology, transfusion services and others, provides the coordination of care essential for a healthy delivery. Before surgery begins, preparation for large volume blood transfusion is important. A woman should have large bore IV access, which may include a central line, a rapid transfusion device, and access to interventional radiology if needed. Antibiotics should be given up to one hour prior to surgery, redosed every three hours, and after every 1500 cc's of blood loss. DVT prophylaxis is important, which may be in the form of sequential compression devices. The patient must be kept warm while she's in the OR. In order to facilitate intraoperative identification of the ureters during hysterectomy and when placental invasion to the bladder is suspected, cystoscopy can be performed to place bilateral open-ended five French ureteral catheters and assess the bladder mucosa. In cases where there's a large anterior previa, make a high fundal or even posterior uterine hysterotomy. This requires a vertical skin incision, which should be done in cases with a high suspicion for accreta. The placental location must be known in order to avoid cutting it when making the hysterotomy. Establishing the location of the placenta at the time of surgery involves examining the uterus and avoiding any vascular areas that suggest accreta. A vertical midline hysterotomy is suggested. However, if a low transverse such as a fanonsteel incision has been made, which can happen when the team doesn't anticipate the need to do a hysterectomy, the decision of whether to extend the incision should be made by the surgeon based on the need for further exposure. Sometimes, ultrasound suggests but does not confirm accreta. In these cases, after the baby is delivered, the surgeon can use gentle external massage on the uterus to see if the placenta will separate. Never attempt to manually separate the placenta because this can result in acute and massive hemorrhage. When proceeding with hysterectomy, the umbilical cord should be quickly clamped, replaced inside the uterus, and the hysterotomy should be closed promptly for hemostasis with a large monofilament suture. After delivery and closure of the hysterotomy, place a self-retaining retractor and carefully pack the bowel away from the lateral arms of the retractor to avoid nerve injuries. The fallopian tubes, along with their mesosalpings, are first detached from the ovaries using unipolar or bipolar cautery. Care must be taken to avoid the underlying and often enlarged and engorged anastomotic vessels between the uterus and ovaries. Incisions are made over the pararectal spaces to isolate the round ligaments from the uterine cornua. This allows isolation of the round ligaments and their vasculature from the uroovarian vessels. The round ligaments and their vessels are isolated and transected using bipolar cautery or suture ligatures. The peritoneum over the anterior and posterior leaves of the broad ligament is incised using cautery. This step allows the inferior and lateral displacement of the ureters as the uterus is retracted superiorly and cephalad along with the placenta. The uroovarian ligaments are isolated using sturdy hysterectomy clamps 
transected, and suture ligated using absorbable braided suture. The uterovarian and estomotic vessels are isolated, clamped, transected, and ligated separately. After the round ligament and uteroovarian vessels are controlled, proceed with controlling the uterine vessels proper. The areolar tissues surrounding the uterine vessels are taken down using cautery. Proceed with distal to proximal control of the uterine vasculature. This is the step where the ureters are at greatest risk for injury and when preoperative placement of ureteral catheters, if they are available, is helpful. The uterine vessels are isolated below the level of the placenta laterally and the ureters can be palpated inferiorly and laterally to the vessels. A small bite of the paracervical tissue can be taken to further elevate the uterus and the placenta. The vessels are clamped, transected, and suture ligated using absorbable braided sutures. All these steps are repeated on the contralateral side. The vascular arcade between the fallopian tube and the ovary is controlled and incised with bipolar cautery or suture ligatures. The uterovarian ligament is isolated, clamped, transected, and suture ligated. After the uterovarian ligament has been divided and ligated, the paracervical space is opened and entered facilitating the identification of the engorged blood vessels and palpation of the ureter. In this manner, hemostasis is more readily achieved and injury to the ureter is prevented. The engorged anastomotic vessels between the uterus and fallopian tube are isolated, clamped, transected, and suture ligated. After this step is complete, open the pararectal space in the broad ligament, identify the ureter by palpation, and then isolate the uterine vessels that are anterior to the ureter. The uterine vessels are clamped, transected, and suture ligated. Unlike in a routine hysterectomy, the dissection of the bladder must be delayed until after all the blood vessels are ligated bilaterally. Turn your attention towards the interface between the bladder and placenta. Start the dissection laterally and proceed medially. In the absence of placental invasion into the bladder, a plane between the bladder and the lower uterine segment should be readily visible. Care must be taken to avoid penetrating the placenta as this will result in severe bleeding. Relatively free planes can usually be found inferior and superior to the most adherent portion of the bladder. It is important to further isolate the cervix from the overlying bladder to minimize the risk of a bladder fistula after the repair. After the bladder is freed, the placenta and uterus can be further elevated and the cervix can be isolated. If the vagina is easily palpated, it is cross-clamped and the specimen is resected. If the vagina cannot be readily palpated, an instrument such as a sponge on a long clamp or a large end-to-end -end anastomosis sizer is used to help delineate the anterior vagina. If a plane between the bladder and the uterus and placenta is not readily visible and if abnormal vessels are noted, it is likely the placenta is morbidly adherent to the bladder and partial bladder resection may be necessary. Proceed with a partial bladder resection because that is preferable to uncontrolled bleeding if the abnormal vessels or placenta are breached. To perform a partial bladder dissection, the bladder dome is opened using cautery superior to the adherent or invasive portion of the placenta. The remainder of the hysterectomy can proceed as previously described. Then, the vagina can be entered, and the incision is extended posteriorly and circumferentially. Alternatively, 
the supracervical hysterectomy can be performed if the placenta is sufficiently elevated and if the cervix is difficult to isolate. At this point, the uterus is removed and sent to pathology for examination. The vagina is closed with a continuous absorbable braided suture if it was cross-clamped or interrupted figure eight sutures if it was opened. The affected portion of the bladder is isolated and resected by finding a free space below the morbidly adherent portion of the placenta. The temporary ureteral stents are removed. Double J stents are then inserted, left in place, and the bladder is closed. The ureteral stents are removed 10 to 14 days later via cystoscopy. The bladder is repaired in two layers using fine absorbable braided sutures with an initial mucosal layer followed by a second imbricating seromuscular layer of the same material. To ensure the repair is watertight, inspect the bladder serosa and use a cystoscope to visualize the bladder mucosa. Alternatively, dilute methylene blue can be instilled into the bladder to test for leaks. Drain the bladder for two weeks following the surgery. Prior to discontinuing the catheter, proceed with avoiding cystogram to ensure the closure is well healed and that no fistulas have formed. When bleeding is diffuse and will not stop despite normal measures such as correcting disseminated intravascular coagulopathy known as the IC, some options include infrarenal aortic compression, balloon occlusion or clamping of the aorta, each of which carry the risk of distal thrombosis and ischemia. If hemostasis cannot be accomplished surgically, delayed closure is an option. This includes packing the pelvis leaving the abdomen open and transferring the patient to the intensive care unit, which permits correction of DIC. Pelvic packing can be highly effective. This technique involves placing multiple large lap pads tightly into the pelvis to tamponade the area of bleeding. The incision is temporarily closed with abdominal stay sutures. After the lab results are normalized on the following day, the patient is returned to the operating room for removal of the packing and final closure. Other techniques have been described for the management of acute maternal hemorrhage from uterine atony, but they are less effective for controlling diffuse bleeding from placenta accreta. These techniques will not provide definitive therapy for placenta accreta. They should be considered only for temporary management while awaiting surgical help to perform a hysterectomy. One technique is the placement of a uterine balloon to tamponade the bleeding coming from the uterine cavity. The balloon is inserted into the uterine cavity and inflated to 250 to 500 cc's until bleeding has decreased. While this technique is highly successful in managing active bleeding caused by diffuse uterine atony or lower uterine segment atony, it is not likely to be a successful measure for placenta accreta. B. Lynch is a hemostatic stay suture used for treatment of uterine atony. A large dissolvable suture is placed to compress the entire uterus to obtain hemostasis. This technique is not likely to completely control bleeding caused by placenta accreta. In severe cases, some have reported delivering the baby and delaying the hysterectomy. Studies are inconclusive about whether this is the preferred option. In some circumstances, a surgical team finds that the severity of an accreta exceeds their skills or their facility's support systems. If this is the case, after the baby is delivered and the hysterotomy is closed, and if the patient is stable, she can be rapidly transferred to a medical center with a higher level of support. Women who have undergone prolonged surgery and massive transfusion are at greater risk for post-operative complications. These women often do better in the intensive care unit. It is important to note that breastfeeding is still possible, even when a woman is intubated. A breast pump can be used to initiate lactation among women who want to breastfeed. Hemorrhage resuscitation centers on obtaining additional large bore intravenous access, administering fluid, 
while activating massive transfusion and replacing blood loss according to clinical evaluation, vital signs, ongoing bleeding, and laboratory data. Concurrent early administration of uterotonics and antifibrinolytics, if appropriate, may decrease blood loss in the early stages. If blood loss is significant and resuscitation falls behind, it is important for the anesthesiologist and obstetrician to consider emergency temporizing measures to allow resuscitation to catch up and avoid progression to circulatory arrest. Temporizing measures that can be used if necessary include uterine balloon tamponade, B-Lynch suturing, aortic compression, and abdominal packing. These temporizing measures may be helpful while hysterectomy equipment and personnel are being mobilized. Arterial line placement immediately following initial resuscitation measures is valuable for monitoring hemodynamics and laboratory trends. Maintaining normothermia and coagulation status, including calcium and fibrinogen levels, are critical during any obstetric hemorrhage resuscitation. While the initial management in most cases may be done under neuraxial anesthesia, that is spinal or epidural anesthesia, conversion to general anesthesia and securing the airway is frequently required to provide adequate surgical exposure and patient comfort during an unplanned caesarean hysterectomy. Initiating early steps of hemorrhage resuscitation prior to converting to general anesthesia may provide more stable hemodynamics during induction. Conversely, waiting too long into a resuscitation may lead to a more edematous and difficult airway. Establishing the obstetric airway includes appropriate airway positioning, aspiration precautions, and having backup plans. Optimizing these preparations will maximize the potential success and safety of the first intubation attempt. Maintenance of anesthesia with nitrous oxide and or intravenous anesthetic rather than a volatile agent may decrease uterine atony related bleeding. Pharmacologically maintaining skeletal muscle relaxation will facilitate surgical exposure. Intraoperative and postoperative analgesia for unplanned cesarean hysterectomy is similar to that of a planned hysterectomy. Intraoperative options for analgesia include intravenous, epidural, and local and regional routes of administration. Multimodal analgesia with non-opioids, such as acetaminophen, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, gabapentin, epidural infusions, or transversus abdominis plane blocks are recommended. Opioids in the form of epidural, enteral, or intravenous patient-controlled analgesia may be effective for acute postoperative pain. Anesthetic management of an unplanned caesarean hysterectomy is complex and requires vigilant, dynamic, multidisciplinary care. The major intraoperative medical considerations of obstetric anesthesiology for an unplanned caesarean hysterectomy are hemorrhage resuscitation, anesthesia, and analgesia. It's important to keep in mind that non-technical skills are still important during an unplanned caesarean hysterectomy. These crisis resource management skills include calling for multidisciplinary help early, designating leadership, anticipating and planning, communicating effectively, and mobilizing resources. Effective close communication between the anesthesiology team, surgeons, and nurses is important throughout the process of an unplanned caesarean hysterectomy. The patient and family members must be kept in the loop as much as possible. Being prepared with the best possible team and the best possible support that you can put together before that delivery, I think that's protective of everyone involved. Obstetricians faced with a potentially severe placenta accreta, procreta, need to have a team. They need to have as much support as they can possibly have around them. Consulting and not trying to be a single-handed hero in this case is the reason that I'm still here.
I had an obstetrician who realized she wouldn't be able to deal with this by herself and she was not afraid to call in the troops and see how many of her colleagues she could have to support her, to advise her, to be there in the moment, to react. And that ended up being life-saving.